the motivation for joint follow-up observations and uh, future plans and capabilities of ground-based detectors. So in two sentences, that's what I'm going to do. But the motivation is, it is whole, very, very incomplete. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will cover the, you know, the full spectrum of what we can do with joint observations when we uh, talk, you know, talk during the panel. So uh, there is a very strong case why joint observations would be helpful purely by looking at Einstein's equations. Namely, gravitational wave sources are essentially relativistic and compact, and therefore they can inform us both about fundamental physics and astrophysics. I want to just uh, very quickly go through that. So this is really the generic case. Why is this so? In Einstein's equations, that is the coupling constant, 8 by g upon 3 to the 4. On the right hand side, you have energy momentum tensor, left hand side, is the Einstein tensor, which is essentially curvature. Therefore, it's one upon area. This is force upon unit area. So this quantity here is one upon force. So that coupling constant has dimensions of one upon force, and that force is 10 to the 44 newtons. When do we expect to expect astronomical systems to experience that kind of force? We only have to look at uh, self-gravitating objects. We will not put any Maxwell here, only Einstein. In that case, that's the force felt by a self-gravitating object, let's say in a binary system. So we can use Kepler's law to replace that V square upon V square or M by R, whichever you prefer to choose. Uh, either way, you get um, this force to be C to the 4 upon G, which consists of that coupling constant, multiplied by V by C to the 4. So in most circumstances, this V in solar system, for instance, is 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. So this is something like 16 to 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the largest force forces nature can experience. In other words, in terms of compactness, it goes like the square of the compactness. So unless you have relativistic sources, sources that are very close to speed of light, and uh, you know this V by C is uh, in a self-gravitating system, <coughs> not in compactness, then um, unless you have that, you, you, you're not going to have strong emission of gravitational waves. So strong gravitational wave sources are essentially both relativistic and compact. We can even look at the amplitude of gravitational waves, let's say from a binary system of stars. This is similar. It's a product of uh, some uh, potential of the source. This is the self-gravitational -gravi potential of the source multiplied by the potential of the source at a great distance. So this m is a, a characteristic mass, r is a characteristic size, and d is the distance. So if you look at that, that again can be expressed in terms of either compactness or velocity, and that too goes like v by c to the 4. So unless you have relativistic sources, we can't really expect uh, strong emissions, and the ones that we are going to detect are essentially going to be either compact sources uh, of black holes and neutron stars. Uh, of course, we can have a long-lived source. If it is weak, we can still detect that. And it doesn't have to be very relativistic or compact. But primarily, all of our strong sources are going to be what they are. And compact binary mergers are standard sirens. It is a well-established uh, 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 theoretical aspect. And I'll show you how that is. But even when we can measure the distance to the sources, we can't measure their redshift, uh, especially if they are binary black holes. Uh, I, I put a question mark here because uh, if they are binary neutron stars, gravitational wave observations alone might be able to tell you redshift, but probably not very well. But I won't go into that unless people ask me a question. So why are these uh, standard sirens? Our gravitational wave amplitude, what I showed you two slides ago uh, for, for compact binary resources, have uh, two different things that we need to measure. The mass of the object, we call it chirp mass, but it's really something related to the total mass, and the distance. We have to in order to extract the distance, we have to measure that uh, chirp mass. There is frequency here, which we measure, and the frequency integral 
that's the phase, we measure that, that's all fine. But the point is that this chirp mass here determines the rate at which the signal frequency is increasing. So it uh, determines df by dt. In other words, by measuring the frequency uh, or chirp rate, we can extract the chirp mass. That uh, mass is related to the uh, frequency derivative uh, very critically. And we can do this extremely well. You know, the rate at which the frequency is increasing, we can do it extremely well. But the problem, of course, is that in addition to these parameters, there are also angles hidden here. Where the binary is located on the sky, what is its inclination, what is the polarization angle, and all that. In order to do that, you need a network of detectors. And if you're given a network of detectors, you can extract this distance quite, uh, uh, quite well. I say quite well, within a factor of two you can measure the distance to sources. Uh, maybe 20%, 30% for the brightest of the sources that we're going to measure, we can measure distance to about uh, 30 to 50%, not 100%. So, however, what we measure really is not the so-called uh, um, luminosity, sorry, what we measure is the redshift distance, which is uh, the real distance multiplied by 1%. And also, we measure redshifted chirp mass. We measure not the chirp mass, the intrinsic chirp mass, but bloated up by a factor of 1 plus that. Uh, this is good because then sources at greater redshifts are more massive, and therefore, they'll be brighter in our detectors. But we really can't tell whether it's a nearby source, which is uh, more massive, or a farther, lighter source with a greater redshift. We can't tell that. So this degeneracy is built in because of because Einstein's theory does not have any mass scale. And, and because of that absence of mass scale, we can't really tell what is the intrinsic mass of a source. And to be able to do that, we need to measure the this, uh, redshift. And electromagnetic observations obviously can tell you this is the details of the calculation as to why what we observe is 1 plus z times the intrinsic mass. It simply comes from uh, energy arguments and so on. I will not go into that. If these uh, slides are made available, you can look it up. So joint observation, therefore, can help reduce the redshift to at least some of the gravitational wave sources. Uh, binary black holes might be difficult, but uh, one day we might be localizing them well enough and identifying galaxies, host galaxies, to get that. Uh, but electromagnetic observations, therefore, are needed, at least for some fraction of those sources. More importantly, however, knowing where the source is located in the sky can significantly reduce the degeneracies that exist in our uh, measurements. Because our measurements are degenerate with the source position on the sky and the distance. If we can get the distance and the source position, we can measure other things much more accurately and uh, in, in, in increase the scientific uh, benefit of uh, LIGO overgo observations, gravitational wave observations in general. Case three, resolve the origin and astrophysics of short GRBs. The many experts here, I really don't want to talk too much about it so that I don't embarrass myself. But a few points are, are in order, just to do justice to Zabi, who asked me to talk about it, and Imre, who insisted that I should give a talk. I didn't even know that I was supposed to give a talk here. Okay, origin of short gamma ray bursts. We really don't quite know where they are, but there are strong hints that uh, the pro progenitors of uh, short GRBs are likely some binaries consisting of either neutron stars, both of them are neutron star blackholes. But if they are so, then what fraction of them are in double neutron stars or neutron star black holes and so on? That would be good. As I mentioned already, our measurements cannot resolve the degeneracy between inclination and distance. And so jet opening angle is not something that we can immediately measure with one coincident observation. However, if you look at uh, the fraction of gravitational wave observations to um, electromagnetic counterparts that we discover, then that has a much tighter constraint on uh, the opening angle or the beaming angle. So uh, I think it's an unfinished sentence. I don't know what I was going to say, but. <laughs> Uh, no, a phase-on binary can be placed closer. That's what a phase-on binary uh, farther is the same as uh, an inclined binary closer. So we can't really tell the distance, and unless we really have 
other information, correct quality information we got. And, and finally, of course, uh, afterglow models can be tested once we identify them in gravitational waves and then you follow it up. So obviously, these are all uh, extremely good. Science case four, shed light on co collapse supernovae, in, uh, in particular about uh, core bounds. Supernova simulations these days can produce for you collapse. That comes easy. That's Einstein. That's Newton. But it's the more detailed particle physics and astrophysics that is lacking, which doesn't give you how this supernova is going to have shock revival and explosion. So you could either have a supernova explosion or a formation of a black hole, but we don't really have supernova simulations where they are able to cause the explosion, and that is uh, critical for understanding supernova mechanisms. Uh, these supernovae will have a uh, quite a large energy reservoir, uh, something like few times 10 to the 53 Earths. The explosion energy from uh, either simple calculations or from the simulations is about one hundredth of that, only a small fraction. And, and the time scale for this explosion is about 300 to 1500 milliseconds. Um, and, and the formation of black holes could, could form. And you know, it, it's really a lot of questions around uh, supernova mechanisms. And we can observe them in uh, LIGOs uh, and, and Virgo observations, depending on. What is that? Do I do something here? At that time, Greek philosopher Aristotle. I don't think somebody wants to read a few That the Earth orbited the Sun and the Moon orbited the Earth. Is this your computer? Where's the computer? It's even I don't know. I keep this. Is there like a mute button? Maybe nobody else hears it. Yeah, I hear it. No, we don't hear it. Oh, you don't? Oh, maybe we should just. I know we don't hear anything. It sounds like a Somebody doesn't like you to talk. What happens? You, you it's probably that YouTube man. What happens? This commentary. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, it doesn't have the binary black hole one here. The binary black hole one is uh, pretty boring. It, it just, it is similar to this one here, where it has a characteristic curve, and because of the absence of scale, uh, this is more or less the same if the black hole spins are not there. If the black hole spins are, are present and, and appreciable, uh, for the detection so far, we don't have large enough spins, or maybe they are face on, so we don't see much variety in our detection so far. <coughs> but in the absence of any significant spins, they are all going to be similar. Uh, but in the, when, when, when one of the components is a neutron star, we can expect uh, uh, quite a lot of variety, including the peaks that uh, uh, Davide mentioned uh, earlier. But these peaks are going to be at high frequency. So the question is, can we really detect anything uh, in the initial um, stages, we are at the level of something like between 50 and 100 megaparsec. We might be able to pick up uh, very easily EM uh, afterglows if they occur in within that dis those distances. But to observe the merger part of the signal would require us, uh, I think I'm going to skip this because these are about the rates and I have you know, conclusions similar to what Sri Piran was saying implies a detection rate of 0.2 to 50 per year based on some generic arguments. I'll leave that. But um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, by the neutron star uh, coalescence waveforms. So this is where um, we, uh, we can be confident the early in spiral modeled by post Newtonian theory. We are pretty confident this early part. But the late merger part, uh, we are beginning to have some control. Uh, by the neutron star simulations together with some detailed modeling using effective one body approximations giving us handle on that. But it's really the post-merger part where we are at the moment lacking in any uh, proper astrophysical models, either predicting uh, what kind of afterglows might be there or even predicting binary, sorry, the gravitational wave uh, merger, post-merger oscillations. They are not. Uh, accurate enough, as uh, David mentioned in the morning, uh, they, they, these models are beginning to, be uh, uh, beginning to be compared from different groups. Here, it's dominated by gravitational radiation back reaction, so masses and spins. We can measure those from the spiral part. Tidal effects appear at the higher post Newtonian orders, not just uh, during the merger. Therefore, they will be important in this uh, last few cycles. They will tell us uh, about the structure of neutron stars. Um, uh, and, and more importantly, there is very complex physics of the merger remnant. And it's a multi-messenger source. So we, it will be extremely interesting to observe that and extract the uh, neutron star equation of state of high density matter. It's a fundamental physics question. We all know that. But how do we accomplish that? I will skip this. And it, it is accomplished because by, by looking at what kind of merger simulations or merger waveforms we observe. Here, what we have is uh, different neutron star, binary neutron stars of different uh, masses, but the same equation of state, and different equations of state, but the same masses. So this matrix of waveforms and database is how we might be able to obtain, finally, the you know, e information about the equation of state. How does the equation of state change? Um, so it becomes more and more um, uh, compact uh, as you go up. So this is less compact, that's more compact. And so there are more cycles before that object merges. Uh, more compact means uh, these are softer equations of state, those are harder equations of state here, and so on. So those are the, the variety of waveforms. You know, there are a large number of uh, the simulations that people are looking into. And what you observe is, uh, in the spectrum, specific lines. And uh, have made, in different talks, the comparison that these spectra are like uh, the atoms of uh, gravitational wave astronomy. I mean, by looking at these, you should be able to say what kind of system we are observing, if we can really pre precisely measure those lines. Uh, and those lines also shift. Uh, wholesale to lower frequencies, and uh, there won't be any mass redshift uncertainty, unlike in the case of uh, binary black holes. There's no, there's no way of getting rid of uh, 
the you know the tidal effects and the actual size of the neutron star. So measuring these uh, post-merger oscillations is a big deal, and and we have been uh, trying to uh, model post-merger oscillations. There have been many different efforts. This is one effort in which I am involved. Uh, for instance, uh, a very simple. I mean, be because we know the the fundamental reason for these uh, lines, they are basically normal mode oscillations of these objects. And so we can write down these oscillations as exponentially damped uh, sinusoidal oscillations with some additional frequencies present. And when you do that, you can look at, zoom in, you can see the model which is in light and the actual simulation after a few cycles, the two agree very nicely. I think I'll quickly go through this. That's the spectrum, we measure, you know, we predict the two lines uh, pretty well, that's for another equation of state and its corresponding spectra. Uh, the third one and its corresponding spectra. I think we are able to capture, but this is really uh, uh, too early uh, to be completely uh, reliable, but it can be done. One can extract uh, these waveforms pretty well. And combine then with uh, electromagnetic observations, which would help us uh, to resolve many of the degeneracies I mentioned, one can obtain uh, the radius measurements at the level of something like 10%. Uh, this shows the, the fractional error as a function of uh, the, the actual size of the neutron star. And it, it's at the, I mean, it shows at 5% or 6% level, but that's based on Fisher matrix calculations, but the Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates are about a factor of two orders. Yeah, question Kenta. Yeah. Have you calculated like mismatch of feeling factor between the numerical waveform and your analytic? Oh, what, uh, have I taken the bias? Uh, no, mismatch of feeling factor. Ah, uh, that is accounted for, but I still don't trust these numbers fully. Uh, the reason is uh, one has to, I mean, this is not to be thought of as the final statement on this. It is a motivation to get those uh, post merger oscillations modeled by hand, not just the spectral lines, but actually the phasing of those waves, because it's only then we can get yeah, these measurements extremely accurate. That's the way, that, that, that would be my motivation. So I see the model that you're constructing by adding different frequencies. If you already have a catalog of simulations, and the point is to nail down the, the actual physics happening there, why don't you use something more basic like machine learning? Oh yeah, we can. I mean, this is the motivation. It, it's, it can be done. I think it's, it's, I compare it with uh, modeling uh, heavier elements, how it is done. I mean, it doesn't matter how you model it. You have to predict where those lines are going to be and what's, what is their width and how well we can uh, compute that is important. It's not, the, the actual method itself is not important. I'm trying to motivate that. We, you know, about two or three years ago, people thought it is completely hopeless to model the merger, uh, post-merger oscillations, it's not true. We can really do a pretty good job of doing it, and that's the motivation. And, and what we can do once we have those good models. Uh, but this cannot be done by electromagnetic observation, sorry, by gravitational wave observations alone. It needs to be combined with uh, EM observations. Anyway, I, at this part, it is a motivation for tomorrow's panel discussion. So if you want, I can stop here and uh, go to the next one. And we can show these tomorrow because I, I'm going to talk about what is the accuracy with which we can uh, pinpoint a source on the sky with future detectors and so on. Should we'll we stop here? In, in, uh, huh? We'll have a panel right after your right? Oh, uh, yeah. This, this, we were all, I mean, you asked us to yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> talk yeah, tomorrow, yeah. so this was a preparation for tomorrow. Yeah, very good. I'll very quickly go through that, and yeah, then we can come back yeah, to this yeah, tomorrow morning. Yeah, How much time do you have? Let's say five minutes. That's it, okay. I, I can stop here, no problem. Oh, five, five minutes. Okay, okay. all right. So, <laughs> <laughs> these are the planned detectors worldwide. And as many of you know, this was uh, such a political move. Our prime minister uh, <laughs> in India <laughs> approved this one week after our <laughs> announcement and got maximum coverage in Indian newspapers. So LIGO India is now uh, not just a planned project, but it is approved. At the day. Uh, the baseline starts at something like 10 milliseconds, that's 2015. As you keep going, 
2017, with Virgo added, we have 25 milliseconds. With mm -hmm. Tonga added, these are made up dates by myself. Okay. I expect something like 2020 for Kagra. What would you say? Okay. I think yeah. that's the official. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is about 30 milliseconds. And well, then the we plus have. Catches everything. Huh? The plus catches everything. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then with India, we have 40 milliseconds. If you had a detector somewhere in Australia, it will be about 43 or 45 milliseconds. That's the broadest uh, baseline you can construct. So we're not quite there, right? Eh? But 40 milliseconds, it's uh, you know, within 10 percent, 20 percent of that. So that's where uh, 10, 10 to 20 percent. That's where we are. But uh, this is a slide that reinforces what Leo showed you in the morning: the holes on the sky with just uh, one detector, which gets, which, which remains because of uh, the similar way Hanford and Livingston are uh, oriented. But that gets speed up a little bit with Virgo, provided it reaches similar sensitive. Sorry predicted sensitivity levels, but we are nowhere clear, I mean, so nowhere near that. But with the uh, five detector network operating at comparable sensitivities, whatever their design goals are, we cover the entire sky uh, maybe at something like 20% of the time, because all of them need to be operating at the same time, maybe 20% of the time. So with those, you know, in mind, what is the future? The, there have been many different, uh, uh, ideas that are coming forward, first of all, to improve current detectors by a factor of three. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Uh, maybe um, the current uh, facilities will saturate at some point. We need to start thinking about uh, future detectors. We can't really improve it beyond a factor of three. That's where they will. That's the facility uh, limitation. And then uh, future detectors, Einstein telescope, cosmic explorer, different ideas. And they will have whatever sensitivity in the world. And tomorrow, we're going to continue this discussion. This is just a uh, background. And we'll talk about what kind of distances and sky resolution we can achieve with uh, each of those uh, networks. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. You, you shouldn't have any questions. <laughs> When you said at the um, when you were talking about how um, improving the uh, or you know having having a, a, this the sky position and distance known breaks but for degeneracies, are you referring specifically to your ability to measure tidal effects and, and post um, merger effects? Redshift, for instance. I want to get uh, uh, if you get the redshift and distance, then. Um, and, and of course, the angular resolution, right? You can get the polarization. No, but, uh, well, okay. The reason well. I ask And is you can get the masses, not the masses so well, but the spin components. Really. The spins can be measured better if you know where the binary is and what its orientation is. So I'm surprised that Chris Pankow didn't jump up and start screaming because he has a paper in which he shows that um, knowing the sky position, even knowing the distance, gives you no improvement in the masses and it gives you a very, very masses, marginal no. improvement. I don't think it's masses. It's a spin. Of the primary spin. Huh? It gives you a, a very, very small improvement in the measurement of the primary spin. So I, I'd say I disagree with that statement, except that it really is important for um, measuring the, the, you know, looking at the quasi components. It's mostly I was talking about tidal effects, but I know that uh, they improve a little bit for, uh, they don't improve masses at all. I think spin should improve, it maybe depends on where in the sky they are located. There are certain positions where there is absolutely no improvement. Only but, mildly so, but, but also remember that that study, so I think mostly what that goes into is higher order corrections to the amplitude, yeah. which is not something that was included in the waveform that we, we used. Well, sorry, in one of them. If you include the high hour corrections, absolutely critical when you have long in spirals with uh, dissimilar masses. Mass ratios of 1 is to 5, 1 is to 10, you absolutely have to improve. The sky resolution itself improves by something like factor of 10 in the case of Lisa. Mm -hmm. 1,000 when you have, when you include those higher order harmonics. I'd be very surprised if intrinsic parameters Knowing those sky positions, this is the reverse problem. 
knowing those calculations don't improve. Well, I mean, just that we haven't done the, the full. Those, that conclusion is in question because there are high order corrections in the waveforms that it didn't account for. Well, no, no. I mean, like, we don't really have a lot of the higher order corrections incorporated into those waveform models. Like, really, the things like L equals 2, N equals 0 mode. I, I have some space slides if you want to go into how including those higher order, higher order modes you know, change the, the character of the waveform completely. I, I can show it to you then. Or, or maybe tomorrow. I'll make, we'll make sure. Yeah. So, I'll just, as, you, as you know this, but uh, you know, in terms of these modes you excite and then they're decaying and you get these lines, frequencies uh, and widths. I'm curious how, how well we can distinguish a mode decaying from the lifetime of the of the object before it forms a black hole. So basically, how well can we determine the collapse time? Or oh, the time, the, the, the decay time? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, well, I guess, yeah, I imagine these modes are decaying through some channel, but then also the object could just collapse to a black hole. And they, mo they might, might both produce okay. a certain width. Uh, I don't remember, but those okay. all go into those calculations of finally getting the okay. radius. We didn't care about, you know, how to, did, how, how, what's the accuracy with which we can measure the time scale. The thing is not very well because these are very broad lines. Right. Therefore, the frequencies and decay times can't be measured too well, at, at least at the moment. Uh, but the idea was to uh, to look at the peak, where exactly the peak is, and that would tell you inform the, but not the width. So the error on that might be pretty bad. Yeah, because I think that's one of the things that we think the counterparts might be very sensitive to, okay. is whether the neutron star survives for 10 milliseconds or 100, 500. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. So Depends on it's it just yeah. basically it's hard to measure. Yeah. How did you map the um, measurement accuracy of the oscillation frequency of the post merger hypermassive neutron star to radius? Did you use one of those? Right. Stars so the inspiral part can give you the tidal uh, uh -huh. effect. Yeah. yeah. And the post merger can give you the compactness. Okay, I, I didn't. I missed a few slides where you know very well that compactness is related to um, tidal polarizability, and so measuring the compactness and tidal um, uh, deformability will allow us to then infer the radius. So it was really combining both in the in spiral. In yeah, in yeah, yeah. Combining the in spiral and the post merger is what that result is. It's not just. Uh, uh, post merger oscillation. It can't. Post merger oscillations can't give you anything. And one thing I missed telling you is that that was about uh, 30 or 50. You saw the numbers, right? It was not just one observation. It was combining 30 or 50 or 100 observations. You have different errors. Chris, uh, so one thing that we we tend to ignore, probably for good reason, but we tend to ignore in gravitational waves is the charge of the black hole. And I'm curious if you think that that plays any role or could play any role uh, in electromagnetic emission from binary particles. At the level, if I am a few, I mean, if I put my complete theorist hat, I would say any charge in the black hole will be discharged in uh, And in order to have that significant charge, we would have seen other effects. In, in black hole candidates, if, if it was going to produce, it's like two charges going around each other. Is that what you mean? No chance. That's the last thing. I because think, I think the are because the, the waveform yeah. rules that out at a, at a low level. If there were charged black holes, like yes, it would provide a because the, Yeah. So people have looked at order of magnitude estimates of what the black hole charge is going to be. That's tiny. We can't even measure it. There are only upper limits on uh, what the charge is. Okay. On, on, the, on the events that we have detected so far. Uh, thanks, Satya. Uh, yeah. We're going to continue with more um, science-related discussions. So we have two more events for today, two more things. One is the uh, next panel discussion, and then we're going to have a few bottles of wine uh, in the corner. <laughs> Very important. Yeah, we both thank you. Yes, so, um,